Hi, I'm your host, Larissa Wurstiak. Through this podcast, I aim to empower and inspire jewelry entrepreneurs and innovators so they can thrive by doing what they love. I'm passionate about digital marketing for jewelry brands, and I'm excited to share my passion with you. This is episode 137, and today I'm going to share my tips for repurposing your content so you can really make the most of your content creation efforts and establish a meaningful and captivating presence on the platforms where your customers are spending the most time. This one will be really short and sweet, but it will help you streamline your workflow and be more efficient in your marketing efforts. But before we get to today's episode, I wanna share some marketing related news and insights from the past week that caught my attention. So first, you may have heard about this. Of course, Tiffany, the legacy brand. There was an article in JCK about how under the leadership of 29-year-old Alexandre Arnaud, Arnaud, I don't know if I'm saying that right, he's the executive vice president of product and communications for Tiffany & Co. Their advertising has significantly changed. You may have heard on another podcast episode how I talked about how Tiffany recently pulled its famed page A3 ad in the New York Times, and then also the April Fool's Day joke where the brand changed its brand color from Robin's egg blue to yellow. So now their new slogan is not your mother's Tiffany, but it's not really sitting well with all of Tiffany's customers. Some customers are finding that the slogan is insulting. Previous generations that really were responsible for bringing Tiffany to the point it is today. And another another customer stated that, quote, they no longer want me or anyone over a certain age as their customer, end quote. And some people are feeling like they're, that Tiffany is abandoning customers over the age of 40. I'm sure Tiffany knows what they're doing, but for now the reaction to this new slogan is not too positive. I'd be curious to know what you think about it. Another article from uh, Google's own blog is all about how Google search results are generated and how Google is trying to offer greater transparency in how those search results come up for users. So Google search systems are designed to sort through billions of web pages to find users the most relevant and reliable results, and not only that, but to really present them in a helpful way. So the way that Google determines relevant and reliable information for a given query is based on a lot of different factors that go into play for that algorithm. And they're also always changing because Google doesn't want any SEO experts to crack that algorithm. So it's in their best interest to kind of keep updating and refining it. However, this new feature that Google is releasing called About This Result will show searchers information about some of the most important factors used by Google search to connect results to their queries. So in this way, Google's really trying to create more transparency. Some factors that will be seen on this about this result panel will be matching keywords, related terms, looking at links and local relevance. So it'll really help users kind of better understand the thought process about why they're being delivered certain search results. And it would also help brands kind of understand why certain search results are given for keywords that they may also want to target. So I think this is a really positive step forward in general. And finally, an article from JCK was all about the pandemic's positive effect on the jewelry industry. So COVID-19 appears to have had a positive impact on jewelry sales, and the industry is in a much better position than where it was pre-pandemic. Is that surprising to you? Because of the months-long closures of brick-and-mortar stores, 72% of consumers said they bought jewelry online, and a surprising 39% said spending so much time at home inspired them to purchase more jewelry. I think I may be part of that percentage. (laughs) Because of the switch to virtual meetings, 41% wanted to wear jewelry that could be seen on screen. Kind of dress it up a little bit. When you're wearing yoga pants on the bottom, you at least gotta put some effort into those hoops. And the poll found that nearly two thirds of respondents, 63%, 
prefer to purchase jewelry in store with 25% calling out independent jewelers specifically. Only 28% prefer to purchase online. It's just a sign that retailers really need to focus on making that, that e-commerce shopping experience more pleasant, more inviting, and more personal. Um, and to, to pay more attention to what consumers are seeking. 31% are seeking quality, 23% are seeking design, and 17% are seeking uniqueness. So really keeping your finger on the pulse of what consumers want. If you wanna get the links to the articles I share in this segment of the podcast, you can sign up for my email newsletter by visiting joyjoya.com slash sign up, and you'll get a digest with the links whenever a new episode drops. So today I really wanna talk about efficiency. Marketing can take a lot of time to do well, and especially if you are a solopreneur or you have a really small team of people working for you, you may start to feel like digital marketing is eclipsing your actual creative jewelry making efforts. So when it comes to marketing, how can you really get the most bang for your buck and make your marketing work for you? And that's what I wanna talk about today when it comes to content, how can you repurpose it and really make the most of it? So first and foremost, when it comes to planning your content strategy, and just to clarify, when I say content, I mean any sort of information or media related to your brand that's being distributed to users, your target customers. So maybe that's a blog post, maybe those are social media posts, maybe that's some of your email marketing. Maybe it's videos that you're creating or pin, pins for Pinterest or Facebook posts. Anything that you're really communicating to your target customer. So first, to really make the most of content, you'll want to have a content pillar. So that's a central piece of content that really gets the majority of your energy. You're devoting the most time and focus into this content pillar. So typically for jewelry brands that I work with, that content pillar is usually like a lengthy, in-depth blog post. So let's just go with that example for the sake of this podcast episode. Let's pretend that you have an e-commerce site and you're trying to build out your content and communicate with your target customers across a number of platforms. So you've determined in your research, um, in speaking to customers, in observing what's worked for you in the past, that you could create a lot of value for your audience by publishing a blog post about how to style your jewelry for optimal fall style. Totally hypothetical. <laughs> that may not work for your jewelry brand, but I figured it's general enough we can work with this. So your topic is, how to style your jewelry for a beautiful fall look. You have noticed in the past that your audience loves when you do style tip type posts. They seem to drive a lot of traffic to your site. They seem to also get a lot of people um, interested in specific products because they better understand how they can incorporate those products into their wardrobe and lifestyle. So this is a sure bet for you. You wanna pursue this. So you'll see a lot of different advice online about how long a blog post should be to be successful, to be optimal. If you Google how long should a blog post be, you're gonna see a lot of different numbers there. In my personal opinion, the very bare minimum that you can do is 500 words. Anything less than that, uh, I would say try to expand on that idea, maybe combine it with a different topic to make a larger topic. Or maybe that's just not well suited for a blog post. Maybe it's better suited for an Instagram or Facebook post because you have just less content there. If you wanna have an even better chance of getting ranked for your blog post in search engine results, you might wanna shoot for like 1,000 to 1,500 words. Now, I don't know if you have any like perspective on what word count feels like when you're writing, but if you don't write regularly, if you're an inexperienced writer, a thousand words can feel pretty daunting. That's, that's a lot of writing. And uh, it's not typically something that you can just come up with off the top of your head. It typically requires some thoughtfulness, at least a little bit of research, 
a lot of detail, some expansion. Um, and you also need to be a pretty good writer to sustain the reader's interest for that long, um, especially on a digital platform where people might, you know, have trouble reading on a screen or just get bored easily um, because of the, the digital nature of the blog post. So if you're serious about a blogging strategy and you've listened to my podcast and you've heard me talk about the value of blog posts and you really want to pursue it, I would really recommend potentially hiring a copywriter or maybe finding someone to work with or someone on your team who is a naturally skilled and talented writer because doing a blog post well, especially if you're doing it for the purpose of really making the most of it and repurposing it, is not for beginners or for people who hate writing because I think that that will come through in the writing. So that's just the side note. You want to find someone who is capable of doing this well. So once you, you know, have an outline, maybe you even have a draft of that blog post, you've optimized it with keywords that you think people would search to get from Google to your jewelry brand. You've included a lot of value in there, like things that a reader could actually take away from it and feel happy and excited that they looked at your blog post, even inspired to purchase some of your products. You also want to make sure that you have a lot of media in there. So photos, maybe video, perhaps audio, maybe graphics, infographics, or like an actual graphic that shows how to style something. Um, Anything visual or even for your ears, auditory, I guess is the right word, to complement the writing because we all know that reading on a screen can be difficult, will help guide the reader's eye through the page, help them kind of get the point quickly, and help them enjoy your content in a lot of different ways and have the freedom to choose how they want to digest that content, whether they just want to look at the pictures, whether they just want to skip to the video, whatever that is. So have like a comprehensive approach to communicating whatever idea it is that you want to communicate. This may require you to take some new photos or videos. They don't necessarily have to be done professionally. I think we all have the capability to do these things with our smartphone. So um, it could be an amateur job to to communicate these ideas. As long as they look clean and accessible and not like a three-year-old did them, I think that that's totally fine to complement your blog post. You can take it a step further and maybe partner with a graphic designer to kind of help you create some images or graphics. Um, You can find someone on a freelancing site like Upwork or Fiverr. Whatever route that you choose to take, it should all seek to communicate one big idea that you think your target customer would find valuable. So once you have this central piece of content all fleshed out, you can hopefully easily derive other pieces of content simply by kind of pulling from it, pulling pieces from it, altering it slightly, repurposing that content that you've already created. So for example, now that you have a blog post, you can build an email campaign around it and maybe highlight some of the products that you've mentioned in your blog post, linking to all those product pages. You can create multiple pieces of social media content, including Instagram post carousels, reels showing these fall style tips in action, Instagram stories. The possibilities are really endless, especially if you've done a great job fleshing out that blog post because you should have all of these like mini pieces of content that you'll be able to pull from in that blog post. Creating that central blog post also kind of helps you establish a tone and like a flavor of language that you can kind of pull from. I have a client that I work with occasionally who works with a professional copywriter. The copywriter does her blog post every month and then very intelligently, my client just kind of takes snippets or sentences or phrases from that blog post 
because she herself would admit she's not a professional writer, she doesn't like writing, but she's already had her copywriter create this like bigger piece of content and now she just pulls the language and the phrases that she likes the best. She can repurpose them in social media captions, in email campaigns, and in that way, not only does that make her life a lot easier <laughs> and less stressful, but it also brings a natural consistency into all of your marketing efforts. So another way that I really like repurposing blog content is for Pinterest. I think these two things work together very naturally. So to kind of better explain how you would do that, I just want to give you an example of something I literally just searched on Pinterest. So I went on Pinterest, I searched in the search box how to layer necklaces. I saw a lot of photos of styled layered necklace looks. I also saw some graphics with like how to text headlines. There was one in particular that happened to catch my eye. It was a six second video pin and it showed a few different layering options for their different product styles. It also featured the text over the video and it was three necklaces worn six ways. I just liked the way it looked. I liked the dynamic nature of it, so I clicked it. When I clicked on the link for the pin, I was taken to a landing page for the brand Amyo, I think I'm saying that right, jewelry. So this landing page, it wasn't really your traditional kind of blog post, but it was built specifically as like a content distribution page. So on this page, they were specifically promoting this one collection called the O Collection that makes necklace layering really easy, no brainer style. So not only did this page have like how to photographs that showed all the different ways you could style these necklaces, but they had a curated selection of videos they had posted on YouTube showing all the different ways, very dynamically, how to layer these necklaces. And then at the very bottom of the page was where you could shop the collection. So it wasn't so sales focused. Of course, there's a sales element there. Um, it was more educational. It was more focused on offering value. And it really made me feel coming from Pinterest like I wasn't just get going to a sales pitch or that it was some kind of like sponsored post or like going directly to the product. Instead, I could take the time to see myself, all the different looks, take the time to decide on my own what I liked the best and maybe how I would put my own spin on it. And then if I still really enjoyed the brand, if I enjoyed the content they were delivering to me, I did have the option to shop at the very bottom of that page. I loved that. I thought that was so smart. Also incorporating the medium of YouTube, which is what I want to mention next. So you could take that central blog post, say we're working with the topic how to style for fall looks, and do a YouTube presentation either on your own or with some someone else in the video showing different looks. How can you style the jewelry with those looks? I think especially for YouTube, the things that tend to do well on those are like how to style videos because people really crave that information in a visual format. It's easy to watch someone explain or show something and then digest that information. So having that video not only complement your blog post, but being searchable on its own on YouTube is another way to repurpose that content. After some time, when you kind of build up your store of blog posts, you can start to pick out the most evergreen content and build it out. So by evergreen, I mean things that aren't necessarily bound or restricted by time period. So maybe that fall style post two years from now may not be as relevant because there are different trends or different ways to style <laughs> jewelry that are more favorable. But perhaps you can go and update that post later to make it more current. So you have already done the work of creating that content. It lives on your site for a long time and you can always go back and update it, make it more relevant, 
build it out even more. If it's driving a ton of traffic to your site, you may even want to consider making it a more, even more permanent central staple on your site. Maybe there are opportunities to even take that content, build it out even further, do like a video series about it, do a blog post series, expand on that content, do a follow-up, a part two. There are a lot of different possibilities, but the trick is to just get started so that later you can continue building upon it over time. So those are my tips. These are tips that can really help you streamline your marketing efforts and get more bang for your buck so that you don't feel like you're just spinning your wheels, churning out content all the time. I think a lot of brands feel that way today because there's such a demand, there's such a need to feel like you're keeping up with your competitors. But if you kind of create this pillar content that you put all your time and energy into and then find ways to pull from it, you will get more um, value from the effort that you're putting in and you'll be able to kind of be present on more platforms or even just experiment with more platforms. If you're really thinking about it from a multimedia perspective, having that one idea and thinking about how can I tell this story in multiple ways? Because of course, everyone likes to also digest or consume information in multiple ways. So in that way, you're not neglecting anyone from your target audience. So what do you think? You can always email me Larissa, that's L-A-R-Y-S-S-A at joyjoya.com. As a reminder, my book, Jewelry Marketing Joy, is published and ready to ship. If you'd like to learn more about the book and order your own copy, please visit joyjoya.com book.